Hey, Lake Point, Pastor Michael here to get you caught up on the fourth week of our series, Things I Wish Christians Knew About the Bible. In it, we've been looking at some of the common questions and misconceptions people have about the Bible. In week one, we looked at how the Bible actually came to be and dispelled the myth that it fell out of the sky leather bound and ready to go. In week two, Pastor Nate shared how the Bible was divinely given, yet humanly composed. Then in week three, we tackled the question of what does it mean for the Bible to be authoritative? And this week, we looked at how the Bible was written for us, but not to us. Here's the reality. Every time you flip open your Bible, you are stepping into a strange and alien world. We're talking two to 3,000 years of cultural, technological, philosophical, economical, social, political, and linguistic differences. Yet, we're told that we should approach the Bible looking for what it means to me, looking for how it applies to me, looking for how I can use it to navigate my personal life circumstances. Which is good, but the problem with that approach, the obstacle you may have realized is standing in the way of you reading the Bible in that manner, is that the Bible wasn't written to you. Every time a biblical author put ink to parchment, they had an audience in mind, and it wasn't us. If we think of the Bible as a personal letter from God to us, and then that's how we're going to read it. And when we read it in that way, we end up misusing and misunderstanding what's been written. And so if you hope to know what a Bible passage might mean to you, you need to begin by knowing what it actually meant to them, the original audience. So why are we talking about this? Well, some of, the, some of you are very aware of the strangeness of the Bible, and it's left you kind of maybe feeling overwhelmed and unmotivated to read it. Well, others of you are so familiar with the Bible that you forget how foreign it truly is. You've read it so many times that all the peculiarities within the pages just kind of seem normal at this point. The words, the symbols, the concept you see in the Bible are things you think you understand as you read it through your modern lens, but the truth is those words, symbols, and concepts often have very different meanings to those living in the ancient world. The struggle for all of us is that we can't help but read our culture and experiences into the Bible. And when we do that, we unknowingly change what the biblical authors were trying to say. In order for the Bible to be meaningful, relevant, and applicable to our lives, our first step is to actually defamiliarize ourselves with it. In other words, we have to grasp how strange the biblical world is before we can try to make it familiar to our own world. And so, whether we like it or not, here's the reality. Biblical study requires historical study. God has disclosed himself to us in scripture through particular people, through particular language, and in particular space-time history. It is a historical revelation. And if you lose sight of that, or you try to separate the stories and teachings contained in your Bible from the history that they were written in, it will become very easy for you to kind of miss the plot, the principles, and the application. The truth is, having a little background knowledge can lead to greater insight, which allows for better application. Recognizing that the Bible is for us, but not written to us, should motivate us to learn, discover, read, and hear about what it meant to the original audience. And we, when we discover those cultural differences, it'll impact what we're able to glean from what we're reading, and ultimately, it'll affect how we live out our faith. You see, studying the Bible isn't about information, it's about formation. You don't study the Bible just so you can know more things. You study the Bible so that there's greater opportunity for you to live out what you're reading. I mean, take hospitality as an example. People today tend to think of hospitality as something they do for friends and relatives. You know, having them over for a meal or, or maybe taking them out for dinner. But in the ancient world, hospitality is what a person did for strangers. It's what people did for those they did not know or did not fully trust. Biblical hospitality requires us to look after the immigrant, the stranger, and the refugee in our midst. But if we only read those passages through our modern lens, we're going to think it means that we just need to take our middle class church friends out to lunch every once in a while. So in light of the Bible being for you, but not written to you, here's three simple things we looked at as recommendations for anybody trying to approach the Bible. First, be teachable. This is about the attitude and the position of your heart as you read the Bible and as you interact with other Christians. Be teachable. Be open to having your presuppositions challenged. Be willing to abandon old assumptions in light of new revelations. Remind yourself that every time you read the Bible, you're actually entering a foreign world and everything may not be as straightforward as you're perceiving it. 
be mindful that the authors and the original recipients that they had different underlying views on race and ethnicity. They, they didn't view the world through a scientific and individualistic lens like you probably do. They, they lived in an honor and shame culture rather than a culture of right and wrong, and, and they had a different perception of time. They, they had different, you know, unspoken underlying rules. They, they handled relationships differently, and they even had different virtues and vices. And so, be teachable. Secondly, gather insight. And what we mean by that is, is don't just read the Bible, read books about the Bible. Watch videos about the Bible. Listen to podcasts about the Bible. Purchase yourself a study Bible. Find resources that can complement your Bible reading. Finally, read together. If you read the Bible alone, that's great. But if that's all you do, you might be missing out. You should be reading the Bible as part of a community, as, as part of a group of friends, as a family, as, as part of a small group. I mean, do you know how Jesus read the Bible? Well, in Jesus' day, no one had a Bible. I mean, it was roughly 1,500 years before the invention of the printing press. People didn't own books, let alone Bibles, because books didn't really exist either. What people read, and only certain people, were scrolls. And what you need to know about scrolls is that they were actually incredibly rare. In a village like the one Jesus would have lived in, there would probably have only been just a few sacred scrolls, and those scrolls would have been kept in the local synagogue in a cabinet called an ark. There were scrolls of the prophet's writing, there were scrolls of the wisdom literature, there were scrolls for the history books, and there would have been scrolls containing the Torah, which is the name for the first five books of the Bible. Everything in Jesus' first century Jewish world centered around the Torah. On the Sabbath day, you would go to the local synagogue and the Hazan, or AKA the worship leader, he would take out the scrolls and he'd take them out of the ark and he'd parade them through the congregation, inviting everyone to dance in honor of the Torah. Then the scroll would be open and someone would read that day's Torah portion. Once the scrolls were read, there would then be a commentary and discussion about what it means and how you should live it out. And everybody joined in it was assumed that you had an opinion, and it was assumed that you had questions. It was very much a, a communal experience. Even the design and seating of the synagogue was to allow people to sit in a square facing each other. Now, what's interesting is that in Jesus' world, the Torah started the discussion. It was the beginning of the conversation. However, for many in our world, the Bible seems to end the conversation. We've kind of bought into the line that the Bible says it, I believe it, and so that settles it. But in the first century world of Jesus, the, the Torah was the start of the discussion. You read it together, and then you interpreted it together. You engaged with it. And this wasn't just like an intellectual exercise, this was about life, like how do you live? How do you act? How do you actually treat people? How do you conduct yourself day in and day out? There's an implied dialogue that is meant to take place. And this practice continued on into the early church as the gospel accounts and the letters of the apostles began to circulate amongst the Jesus followers and as they were added to the scrolls of the Torah. The early church would have heard these things read, they, they'd read them together, and then they made decisions about how to actually live it out. And I believe that we're meant to do the same today. We're meant to read the Bible together and then, you know, make decisions about what it means to actually love your neighbor. Make decisions about how to honor and respect life. Make decisions about how exactly you keep one day holy. Make decisions about how to best care for the poor. The Jews and the early followers of Jesus lived with the assumption that there was always something new to learn, always something new to discuss, always something new to talk about because life never stops bringing you events and circumstances that demand you ask, what is the wise thing to do here? So every time you open your Bible, you're entering a different time in history. You're entering a different culture. Be mindful of that. Be aware of that. The Bible was written for you, but it wasn't written to you. So be teachable, gather insight, read it together. Well, friends, consider yourselves caught up. Have fun reading and discussing the Bible together in your life group. I'll see you next time.